Welcome to CXQA Live, the home of the agent-centric contact center philosophy. Agents with the right training tools in connection with your company. We always say we'll be a revenue growth and protection center for your business or brand. They're going to be the best diagnostic tool that you can have for your business. They're going to ensure that your customers are satisfied and connected. They're going to produce more and better work, and they're going to want to stay and contribute to the long-term success of your company. Today on the show, we have joining us for the first time in the hot seat, Justin Robbins, founder and principal of Metric Sherpa. Justin has 20 plus years of experience and customer experience and many diverse roles and parts of CX, parts of the industry. Justin, we're really glad to have you join us and uh, would love for you to share just a quick bit of your vision for Metric Sherpa. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Rob. It is good to be here. Uh, look, Quick vision for Metric Sherpa was this. My career went through three phases. The first was working in the contact center myself. The second was being a trainer uh, and consultant for contact center teams. And the third was inside of technology companies. And I recognized in all three of those uh, kind of distinct uh, roles that, that people were often getting stuck in different places throughout designing and delivering great customer experiences. Uh, so... A couple months ago, I, I finally decided to take the leap and say, hey, what if I build a business that was focused on helping just business leaders recognize and then address and overcome whatever's holding them back from delivering the best possible customer experience? That's where we sit and focus all day, every day. That's strong stuff, man. You know, I'm a big fan of what you're doing. You know, um, I love your, uh, I guess, long earned integrity in the industry. Um, and the way that you see things and you see the value of people, which of course is connected to what we're going to talk about today, my friend. But uh, before we get into that, a couple of admin items would encourage you guys who are along with us today to use the chat to engage. You know, if you've got, if you've got a question, throw it in the chat. We tend to just kind of mention those as we go along. Um, if you'd like to come on and, and share your question on camera, just mention that when you ask your question. Um, everyone that's along for today is invited to do that. Um, so uh, please engage with us. This is not intended to be just a download or a monologue or whatever. It's intended to be a conversation. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is after our time today, uh, we tend to just jump over into the hangout room. And if you're just watching the session, as soon as the session ends, you'll notice there's a lobby that you probably came through if you were here before uh, we, we pushed go. And uh, you'll be back in that lobby and there's a post discussion that you can jump in and uh, hang with us, chat with us there. Um, and then the th last thing, the third thing, um, our time every week is recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so feel free to catch up on past episodes. If you scroll up in the chat, you can find where I, I po posted that in the past. Um, but uh, today's topic is really interesting, and we, we've been discussing AI very regularly on the show. Um, it's, it's one of the hot topics in CX, maybe the hottest topic right now. Um, it's a hot topic in society right now. Uh, there, there's a, a lot going on with AI in society and, and the global economy. But I want to dig into something very specific with you today, Justin, and that would be the role and value of humans in customer service in an age of AI innovation. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a really important kind of crux topic for all the other topics that are going on. You know, there's a lot of fear. Um, there's a lot of excitement. There's a, there's a, a lot of, a lot of things, um, when it comes to AI right now. Um, last week, Fred and I spoke, um, on the topic of just the simple fact that we think CX leaders and organizations should care about AI, um, you know, and it's not just, okay, wait till more adopters and go through the motions of the most recent fad. Uh, but there, there's a unique opportunity and a unique responsibility when it comes to the adoption of AI when, it, when we're talking about CX, right? And that, you know, we talked about how there are an, an enormous labor force globally that works in CX. There's uh, the simple fact that CX organizations touch so many customers that that represents an enormous portion of the global 
population. And so whatever we adopt in CX becomes something that gets accepted by humans all over the globe and becomes normal um, in ways that very few industries have that kind of uh, influence in, in the way that global societies tend to evolve. Now, the moment that we just had is probably the most uh, purely ethical, uh, you know, cerebral 30,000 foot level non-business component of today's shit chat, because we really want to make that connection between those kinds of questions and issues with the business realities, right? And so the way I, I want to set the table for our conversation is to say this, and that is that businesses are always going to be looking to improve both top line revenue and the profitability that they're able to achieve off of that top line revenue. That is the nature of the beast. That is what business is and does. So the potential to hand off significant portions of agent labor costs to technologies that can handle that kind of work in the contact center, uh, it, it's an enormous potential. It's something that's in everybody's minds. Software vendors are scrambling to say they have an AI solution uh, just to kind of get on the bandwagon. There are also a lot of legitimate, well thought out AI solutions on the market for contact centers. Um, and so there are a few framework questions before I stop talking and we get to hear from Justin his thoughts here. The first being, what is really achievable with AI in this regard? How much efficiency and therefore profitability can be gained? The second would be, what business value will the human to human interaction actually be shown to have as we press into this brave new AI infused CX world? And then the third would be, what are the moral and ethical implications and responsibilities of this? So really going to focus on that middle question. You know, what, what business value will human to human interaction be shown to have as we press into this brave new world of AI infused customer experience? So, so Justin, again, so thrilled to have you. Um, maybe you could just kind of give us an overview of how you currently see AI impacting the customer service industry and how humans are involved alongside the AI currently. Cool. Yeah, Rob, happy to do that. When I think about uh, AI and its impact and its role, probably the most succinct way I can say is it will uh, enable us to exponentially scale how we learn from and leverage data. That I think is the, the underlying problem to be solved. That's the underlying piece that will enable all sorts of transformation throughout business. If I think about what that means for the customer service industry. I, I think and see AI playing three, three unique roles. There's AI that we will leverage to uh, help our, our customers uh, kind of better streamline their experiences. And, and again, if we go back to what, what do I think about AI? I think about AI as how do we learn from and leverage data at scale. So we think about the customer interaction and customer facing AI, customer enabling AI is, is part one. There's the, the employee, the, the service worker, the, the agent, there's then that piece on how will that make them more intelligent in, in how they navigate interactions? How will that uh, eliminate some of their work today? And how can it, again, grow their capability in, in serving customers. The third place I see impacting customer service is through business intelligence. And I think about all of the decisions that supervisors, managers, directors, executives need and want to look to make every single day. And, and in my research and in my experience, the number one thing holding organizations back from acting on their data is effectively aggregating it, understanding what it's telling them and driving action. Yeah, I mean, we know that there's a ton of data. Um, the quality of the data may be suspect in some places, but whatever the quality of the data, the ability to synthesize and make meaningful analysis out of that data is the difference between that data being helpful and unhelpful, right? So I, I think that's where I, I agree with you completely. I, I think that's, that's where we're seeing some of the most effective and impactful strides being made right now. Um, and that's where I think, you know, companies have maybe multiplicative opportunities for growth there. So, you know, kind of 
where we went ahead with this from that overview. And that was a great overview of how you see it, man. Um, there are already businesses that are embracing AI technologies uh, to automate customer service processes. How do you see this trend affecting the value and importance of human interaction in the customer service space? So, Rob, I think this is this is an important thing for us to to get right, and I, I think it's something that a lot of us are going to get wrong before we get it right. So when I when I hear the question of how do I see it affecting in the near term, I see it negatively affecting the industry, and and I believe that in a lot of ways for us to. When I learned how to ride a bicycle, I had to fall off that bicycle a couple of times before I really found my balance. And I believe there it creates this um, a level a, le a level of uncomfortableness in recognizing that there are going to be negative effects in the near term, and we have to balance our need to learn and to right size its application to to customer interactions with risk and complexity and the uncertainty that's that's inevitable there. Uh, wh where do I see it long term? So as we start to normalize and we start to right size. Uh, the, the very nature of it, and this has been part of the conversation that, that I think many people have had, is that it's going to force an elevation in the level of work that's being done. And, and we've seen this naturally evolve over time uh, and in other industries where automation, not necessarily AI, there's been lots of examples of automation taking hold of work that employees once had to do themselves. And, and now we don't have to do it. It just elevated it, and it created new jobs. I think that's going to be part of what's going to be interesting as we think of how it will um, how it will uh, affect and, and shape kind of the importance of the human interaction is we're still serving humans. It doesn't matter if, if we're using automation or AI to do it. We're still serving humans and nobody will ever know humans better than humans. Uh, so I think in how we design, how we apply, how we learn uh, from what these technologies are doing, lots of really cool opportunity there. I think the thing we have to be cautious of, and, and you alluded to this in one of your comments earlier about uh, cost sensitivities and 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 uh, profitability. Uh, just last week, I, I heard of uh, one contact center where a executive was planning to uh, deploy AI and 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 not and like remove all the humans and uh, a bad idea uh, just to do that complete rip and replace. But the other like scary factor was they also weren't going to, to share that with their customers. Um, so their intention was to, hey, we can save a ton of money. And if we don't say anything, maybe nobody will even notice. Uh, so that, that to me is like, what? where's the potential effect? I think there's a there's potential to make really bad and short-sighted decisions as well. Well, and look, we, we've seen this in increasing depth and power with every industrial revolution um, that the initial mistakes at the onset of those industrial revolutions uh, require correction, right? You know, when you first started to see um, mechanized scaled up manufacturing, you know, we had to have child labor laws. We had to have uh, a limitation of the work week. Um, you know, basic human rights had to be applied to the situation because, right. you know, um, businesses were taking advantage of the growth capabilities for the business and ultimately the humans suffered. So I, I think just if you look back in, with a meta view of um, economic history, right, there, there is, a, there is a, a pattern here that correction will be required. Um, but I think there's also in the Internet age the speed at which change is happening um, is is alarming and staggering in some cases. And, and there's also FOMO. There's that fear of missing out that, you know, everybody from the boardroom down to uh, the individual contributors in every com company are fighting to make sure that they don't get behind. And so you tend to kind of overshoot the target, if you will, of the, the ideal outcomes because we're trying to make sure we don't, you know, get behind or, or miss out. So, I think your assessment of the short term is really spot on. Long term, I think, don't you agree? I, th I think I heard this what you said, but I just want to kind of call it out. The effectiveness of how this is going to go is going to be determined on how well we do make those corrections and how well we keep the main thing the main thing over the course of time. Yeah, and, and look, I, I, 
I think to the point of history, there are going to be a number of things that will uh, help to keep that in check and to help keep that in balance. Um, I think it, it will be, look, the, the one of my favorite infomercials from the 90s was the Showtime Rotisserie Oven. And it had this motto of set it and forget it. And I see businesses make this mistake all the time with self-service where they put something into place and they take that set it and forget it approach. AI by its very nature for it to really reap all the rewards and benefits can never be set it and forget it. Right. No. And, and that's where you're even talking about additional jobs that are created, you know, where people who know how to engage with and be masters of the AI to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And they're able to do that in a way that's in accordance with the brand promise and the brand values. And they're able to do that at a high level. Those are the folks who are going to create a space for themselves in the economy um, and are going to help us all keep the AI on track from an economic and ethical standpoint. And I think, yeah. um, you know, that's that's an exciting field. Now, how many of those roles are going to be created in comparison to the number of roles that might transition out of the industry? Um, we don't know is the only real answer. So um, but it's an interesting question. I, I want to pivot us just a little bit here. Yeah. Um, you know, we're kind of building towards some principles, really. Um, maybe you can hit a few things that um, you see as principles that businesses that are trying to evaluate, you know, AI right now for their contact center might be able to employ that would help them to strike the right balance at this stage between automation and the human touch, right? Because we're, you know, they're ultimately trying to deliver a customer experience that delivers value for everyone involved, including the shareholders, it's a publicly traded company, um, all the way through the employee base to the customer. So what are some principles that you're seeing that could be kind of called out at this stage? Um, you know, these, these are definitely not uh, mine and definitely not new. Uh, I think the, the first of those is like, we're to your point, like people don't want to miss out and, and people want to like stay up and, and, you know, be the, the early bird or, you know, whatever it takes to get there. What, what we often happens in these situations is we do something for the sake of doing something and we don't connect it to our broader strategy and to our greater goals. Mm -hmm. and, and we even do this, you know, sometimes to the point of budget, like I watch organizations have really great roadmaps and really great strategies and really great goals and then chase you know, quarterly financial targets because they've got conflicting objectives. So I think one of the, the key principles there is being really clear on what your desired outcome is. What are you hoping to achieve and, and how will you know it when you see it? Right. So, so first off, where are you trying to go? Mm -hmm. The second then is understanding what is the role and impact that you are looking for automation to fill and, and also understanding what is the role and impact that you're looking for people to fill. And in some of that, it might be, how can I create efficiency? Or it might be, how can I take all of these disparate data points that it's easier for me to give a machine access to than it is a person to have access to, or I need a machine to retain more than I should or reasonably expect a person to, right? I start to understand these design principles of what enables AI to thrive in the same way I understand what enables people to thrive. What are the interactions where... It just makes it makes sense and it matters to have a, pe a person be providing service. So in terms of overall principles, again, part of me is beginning with the end in mind. Part of me is really clear on the role and impact that I'm looking for things to have. And then being OK to test and iterate and fail fast. I think that's a really important principle is with some of this stuff start. You don't have to, to, to go at large scale, but start small and, and watch and be iterative in terms of what's the impact that's this having? Is that aligned with where we're going or not? And how do we, to, to earlier point, how do we continue to refine and hone this? And I think getting into that discipline and art uh, will enable organizations to maximize their attempts to uh, automate or introduce artificial intelligence and their ability to, to connect people to the moments where people do what people do best. No, that's really good stuff, man. I mean, all three of those are uh, really, really, really strong. I, I just want to mention one thing that you said, and I want to use slightly different words because we talk about it in this framework all the time. So often the relationship between the human and the tool is misunderstood. 
Um, and what I mean by that is we start with the tool instead of starting with the purpose we want the tool to actually accomplish. And I think AI potentially is no different in that we can get so excited about the tool, we lose sight of what we need it to do. But perhaps in a unique way, it's, it's uh, got some interesting potential pitfalls because it appears to do so much all at one time in some cases that we might lose sight of what we were trying to get it to do. Or if we didn't even have that uh, clearly defined, and I always use a requirements matrix spreadsheet when I'm trying to buy something and try to try to give something an objective score because if I really like the salesperson or the brand or whatever, you know, I might get a little carried away with my affection for the product itself mm -hmm. um, and not really be objective. And I think starting with your strategic business goals, you figure out, you know, what you want the tool to do before you pick the tool. And quite frankly, AI might not be the right tool for your goals, or at least not for all of them, just like any tool might not be. And so having that really clear is so critical. And and it's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's not even just about the capability of the, t the tool itself. You know, you can have a really great tool, but if you don't have the right things to, to feed that tool, mm -hmm. and in the case of AI, you can have a really powerful engine, but if I don't have the right data sources, I don't have the, the frameworks in place, it's not not going to be the right it might, might not be the right time and and all this is evolving very quickly um and so you know understanding your actual use case and what data you have to feed the ai and how that is you know the, the quality of that data the efficacy of that data all that stuff is huge variables here um really good stuff so i let's let's pivot once again because we're hitting the the world tour of ai conversations here today um but we we talk about the potential to enhance efficiency and accuracy potentially in, in customer service with AI. But there's one thing that an AI will never do, and that is have empathy towards a human. Um, it might simulate empathy one day, but it will never itself have empathy. So, you know, there's this intrinsic question about having a connection with a human. And I can tell you, honestly, you know, a good company policy when I'm a customer is meaningful to me. But a good company policy and a good connection with a human that's administering that policy to me, um, th that combination is very, very powerful in determining who I want to do business with over the long haul. And so the question is this, um, how can companies leverage AI while still maintaining the appropriate amount of human touch? And maybe the sub question is how to measure or understand what that appropriate amount of human touch is that's required. Yeah, Rob, this this question is really a question of strategy above all else because there is there is going to be a increasing acceptance and tolerance for ai in a number of applications that's that's just going to happen and we are we are always going to be in this place where the technology that's available is going to be way further ahead than what is maybe accepted and tolerated and if I were running a company that was designing customer service today, I would be trying to, to walk this line between what is, what is accepted and tolerated and, and effective and efficient, right? There's a number of decisions to say, hey, AI is great because people are okay with it. It does the job with a high degree of accuracy. It's, it's capabilities to do these things are all good. And then it comes down to like, strategically though, that may all be true. We may get to a place where if I was to step into the four seasons, everything about my experience could be automated. I make a strategic decision as the four seasons to say, you're going to have a person who opens your door for you. Mm -hmm. You're going to be greeted at a front desk that is staffed by a person. Your room is going to be cleaned by a person. You're going to have a physical concierge that you can go to because that is part of a differentiated experience that I want to stand apart from others who ought to not. Yeah. All of those things at some point, I could do a self-service check-in. That, like, that is done, but it, it comes down to the question of, hey, how do I maintain the human touch? It's, it, do I want human touch to be part of my strategy? And we've already seen brands who said, in some cases, but... Frankly, that's not what matters to us. And I think people are going to crave and 
And this is like the, the crazy part, probably be willing to pay a premium and we may be decades away from this, but the brands that continue to focus on how human can we make this? I think that there's going to be an entire market that's just built around businesses who define themselves by, by their level of humanity, if you will. Yeah. I mean, you, you attach a premium to that, obviously from a business case standpoint, you're talking about premium offerings or even just premium brands that differentiate themselves to a premium market. Um, of course, you could ask the question of what does that mean for those who can't afford to buy into that experience and, and how does that change things for you know, those folks? I, I think about the retailers that went away from cash registers staffed by people to almost exclusively self-checkout and you know, the experience change that that involves, right? Um, and, and, and my analysis of that, when I'm standing there waiting for one of the five self checkout lanes to open up is a little bit different than probably what those executives who made that decision are looking at on the bottom line. And there's, there's potentially a gulf there, right? But at the same time, there's this growing acceptance of these more automated, less personal experiences that creates new niches in the market that creates new Correct. opportunities and that creates the ability for people to differentiate brands based on those kinds of touches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so Rob, the, the shortest companies can leverage AI a ton of ways. The question of how do they maintain the human touch again comes down to strategically, where do you want that to have an impact and where, where does it matter most to your customers as well? That's really good. So a uh, quick yes or no question. Do you think that businesses should be required to disclose to customers when customers are interacting with AI rather than a human? If a customer is interacting with AI, yes. Okay. All right. You heard it here first. Um, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that it, it could be tricky in some applications, but I think an effort to be transparent is is part of you know maintaining a human touch. Even if you're not interacting with a human, you at least know that a human is aware and disclosing to you that you're not. And I think that there's value in that. So one more big thorny one here, my friend. Yeah. Um, Ready? Okay. I get a little stretch too. Um, so one of the challenges with AI systems, of course, is that, you know, AI is, is model, modeling a synthesized version of the human generated data, the inputs from which they've learned. And so along with the data and the knowledge, they inher inherit whatever biases, errors, or even unethical elements that's, that are present in that data that they are trained on. And so, you know, at scale, you know, even if it's 1% or less of the data has errors or issues or biases contained within it, um, we're starting to see a large percentage of those things impact customer experiences, impact human lives, et cetera. So my question is this, how can businesses work to ensure that AI systems that are used in their customer service motions are operating in, in the way in which they're intended when they're interacting with customers? Yeah, Rob, I think there's three three important uh, considerations here, and these are all great jobs for humans right now. One is around the data set and the integrity of that data uh, and, and making sure that it's being maintained and groomed and well orchestrated and designed. Say, hey, this is, this is what we leverage. This is what we don't. Here's how we leverage it. Really clear business rules around what is and isn't used and in what cases it is and isn't used. Second piece, in the same way that we address our humans who have biases and errors and unethical tendencies at times, I think this is going to force an evolution in quality and how we look at monitoring and scoring and evaluating interactions. Uh, in the same way we're, we're doing QA on our live agents, I think there's going to be an entire focus around QA around the automated interactions, which a lot of businesses, even on self-service today, don't have that level of like rigor to measuring because they can barely get to their people. How do I get to the machines? Uh, so I think that's a really good piece. And then the third, which is just a larger uh, discussion to be had is they keep a human involved. If you want to make sure that it's interacted, you keep a human involved uh, at some level of the process, at least as you're getting things scaled and have high degrees of uh, effectiveness and accuracy being demonstrated by, by your tools. I mean, there's a lot there. We could unpack all three of the things you said for a hot minute. Um, but I, I do think it's important to focus on the employment of AI in a way that is still subjugated to human oversight, right? And, and I would argue that that's a principle that should be understood as having multiple values, not least of which uh, that quality assurance parallel value. I mean, I've had so many bad chatbot interactions 
where I'm like, there's no way the company has any idea how bad this is, or they would either fix it or take the chat bot down altogether. Um, yeah. And so I think there's a, there's a, a drastic need for that kind of human oversight. But as we've been saying, there's a huge opportunity there for, uh, you know, career paths for, um, uh, I don't even want to use the phrase, but sort of humanizing AI through that kind of oversight. Um, and, and I think that that's a really powerful thing. So we're pushing up against time, but I want to give you a chance, man, just to leave us with a final word before we close out. Uh, look, my final word is, uh, two words. It's be reasonable. There's, there's a lot going on and there will always be a lot going on and things are evolving fast. Well, you're in this work. I mean, it is iterative. It is messy. Um, a be reasonable in terms of how you're designing experiences and continue to keep yourself in check. Is this, is this an experience that I myself would be, would be, you know, willing to put myself through Would I put, uh, think of the person you care about the most in life. Would you be willing to put them through this type of experience? Uh, be reasonable in your expectations of what is possible right now and what isn't. Um, and, and when people get it wrong and people are going to get it wrong, be reasonable in, in just recognizing that we're all, nobody know, has this figured out right now. Um, and I think we can all, if we're willing to be open and, and give feedback to each other, um, it's, look, it's going to take a bunch of us to get this right. Um, and that I think is just most important to recognize, like no person is going to figure this out on their own. In fact, no person should figure this out on their own. Well said. We'll leave it at that. Thank you for joining us, Justin. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity. It was a great conversation. And um, if you're going to hang around, feel free to join us in the post-discussion lounge right after I push the big red button. You guys have a great Tuesday. See you soon. See y'all.